Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, when it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. When you read Mark's gospel, you begin to think that everyone is in a rush. Immediately Jesus did this. Immediately Jesus did that. The word immediately seems to be in every other paragraph. Our text today chronicles a day in the life of Jesus in Capernaum at the start of his ministry. It has this frantic, breathless pace about it. It is a picture of Jesus in a hurry, on the move. He moves from the synagogue to Simon Peter's house, to the street outside Peter's door, to a deserted place of prayer, and finally hits the road again, for a preaching and healing mission tour in other towns. Jesus is becoming very popular as a miracle worker, and the whole town comes out looking for him. They all stand outside the door at the house in the street. Everyone with a heart murmur or a hangnail is there seeking something from Jesus. And Jesus patiently tends to them all. So you have to wonder, how did he do it? How did he dish out so much healing water without getting drained dry? He seemed to absorb so much of everybody else's pain. I think what happens to a lot of us is that we give and we take people's problems and pain and we get to the point sometimes where we can't do it anymore. Like a saturated sponge we can't hold anymore, then we are no good for anything. I read about Jesus' activity all throughout his gospel and wonder how this didn't happen to Jesus. How come he didn't get drained dry? How come he didn't experience burnout? The answer may be right here in this busy text verse 35, where Mark reports that the next morning Jesus went off to pray. Mark shows us Jesus on the move, but he also shows us Jesus becoming still. He shows us Jesus wading into the middle of the crowds, but he also shows us Jesus withdrawing alone. There is always this kind of back-and-forth movement on almost every page in Mark. Jesus is moving back and forth from the crowds to the quietness. There is a crowd on almost every page. Sometimes the crowd is chasing him. Sometimes the crowd is in the way. And Jesus teaches these crowds, and he heals these crowds, and he reaches out to touches the people in these crowds. But in between, he gets away. In fact, sometimes when Jesus sees the crowds, he heads the other way. He goes off to lonely places. He gets in a boat and goes out onto the water. He goes up on the mountain. It is always this back and forth from the crowds to the lonely place. 
And this kind of back-and-forth movement frames our vocation as followers of Christ. It is the rhythm of our days. On the one hand, we are called to go forth into the world. We are called to serve the world, to care for others, to witness to the love of God in the world. But we also must withdraw, come back to God in solitude, be still. Because if we don't do that, eventually there will be nothing left of us to give. Each of us more naturally moves in one of these directions, toward the crowd or away from the crowd. I know some of you, when you see the crowd coming, you go right at it. You have never met a conversation you didn't like. There are those who find their energy in the crowd for whom solitude seems like wasted time and space. Whereas there are other people, and we know who we are, they see the crowd coming and turn and head in the opposite direction. Some of us see the crowd and immediately go looking for a quiet place. Dostoevsky said of these people, they love humanity. It's people that they can't stand. Those of us in the church who are passionate about going forth and those who feel the need to pull aside, we need each other. Some of us need to tell the others to be still and get connected with God. And some of us need to tell the others to get out there and do something. If all you do is go out on the move and you don't come back to God, there won't be any of you left to go forth with. People might come looking for you and they will find someone who's burnt out, drained, angry, with nothing left to give. You have to stop, come back to God, in the words of the old hymn, take time to be holy. In my time in the ministry, there have been a lot of books written for clergy about self-care. What happens sometimes in the ministry is that you become so involved in other people's problems that you don't have the time or energy to address your own. And there has been a greater awareness of this phenomena in all of the so-called helping professions, social work, nursing, and so forth. But whether you find your vocation in one of these helping professions or not, we all have seasons of our lives when we feel the reservoir of our compassion and kindness run dry. You might think of middle-aged children who find the roles have been reversed and they are now trying to care for a parent who is struggling with health issues, or a spouse who is trying to support their partner through chronic physical or mental illness. Or perhaps you are a mother of young children and so much of your time you feel like one of those jugglers who spin plates on poles. And so much of your day is filled with keeping the plates spinning, and you're exhausted so much of the time. You may be burnt out, and you don't even know it, much less able to do something about it. I saw a young mom wearing the t-shirt that says, I can only please one person a day. Today, today is not your day, and tomorrow doesn't look good either. In his memoir, Telling Secrets, Frederick Buechner writes of watching helplessly as his daughter battled an eating disorder, anorexia nervosa. It seemed that everything Buechner did to try and help his daughter get well was either futile or made things worse. Finally, a doctor intervened and told Buechner that the best thing he could do was stop trying to do anything. He writes, I didn't have either the wisdom or the power to make her well. None of us has the power to change other human beings like that, the power to violate the humanity of others, even for their own good. 
The best thing I could do for her was to stop trying to do anything. Love your neighbor as yourself is part of the great commandment. The other way to say it is love yourself as your neighbor. Love yourself not in some egocentric, self-serving sense, but love yourself the way you would love your friend, in the sense of taking care of yourself, nourishing yourself, trying to understand, comfort, strengthen yourself. He writes, If your daughter is struggling for life in a raging torrent, you do not save her by jumping into the torrent with her, which leads only to you both drowning together. Instead, you keep your feet on the dry bank. You maintain as best you can your own inner peace, the best and strongest of who you are, and from the solid ground reach out a rescuing hand. The imagery of the raging river is evocative. When we see someone struggling against a current, our first instinct may be to jump in after them, with the result that now two people are in trouble. It is better to find solid ground and a branch or a rope to tow them in. Mickey Anders tells of a missionary in Africa who lived in the central mission which had a small generator to supply current for his church and small rectory. Some natives from an outlying mission came to visit the priest. They noticed the electric light bulb hanging from the ceiling of his living room. They watched wide-eyed as he turned the little switch and the light went on. One of the visitors asked if he could have one of the bulbs. The priest, thinking he wanted it for some sort of trinket, gave him an extra bulb. On his next visit to the outlying mission, the priest stopped at the hut of the man who had asked for the bulb. Imagine his surprise when he saw the bulb hanging from an ordinary string. So he had to explain that one had to have electricity and a generator and a wire to bring the current to the bulb. We may be the finest light bulb in the entire world, but if there is no source, no connection, then there is no light. The gospel story today is a story about the power of Jesus' active healing in the world, and it is a call for us to participate in that. But it is also about our tendency to empty out, to lose our connection to the source of the healing and the death that can come when we lose that connection. We are called to live our lives from forward to pause, going forth to coming in, from crowds to quiet. This is the rhythm of our days. It is the rhythm of a healthy, healing life.